The all-night drive-in picture show presents Dylan's First Run Features. Here are your hosts, Ryan Mason and Dylan Mason. This is Lane Hewitt speaking. Welcome to a new feature of the All Night Drive-In Picture Show called Dylan's First Run Features. If you've listened to the show for a while, you may remember my son Dylan from our coverage of the films Killer Clowns from Outer Space and Sinister almost a year ago. As a father and a movie buff, it warms my heart that Dylan has inherited my love of cinema, and we talk about movies all day, every day. In this feature, we will cover Dylan's reactions to seeing cult and mainstream classics for the first time as he educates himself in the world of film. Lately, Dylan has taken a deep dive into the world of Quentin Tarantino. While Charles and I find Tarantino to be a troublesome and loathsome individual, we cannot deny that he is a fine filmmaker. No matter your opinion of the man or his films, there's always something to enjoy about them, whether it be his sometimes whip-smart writing, the wonderful cinematography, the powerful storytelling, or his musically diverse soundtracks. Tarantino never fails to be entertaining. If you want to see famous women's feet, bodies and trunks, overuse of the N-word, and the director on screen in every film, then the filmography of Quentin Tarantino is for you. Today we will discuss Tarantino's nine directorial films, including his half of the Grindhouse double feature Death Proof, and Counting Kill Bill as one complete film. We will also discuss the music of his films, which are always an integral part of the overall experience. So without further ado, we present Dylan's first run features, and as always, there will be spoilers. All right, our first film is Reservoir Dogs, and the cast of this film includes Steve Buscemi, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, Harvey Keitel, Chris Penn, Lawrence Tierney, Edward Bunker, and Quentin Tarantino himself. Dylan, what do you think about this first movie? I think it's overrated. Do you? Yeah, I yeah. really do. It's 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 good, but is it great? No, not not really. I kind of agree with you. I mean, it's his first film, so there's definitely he's definitely figuring it out. It's definitely kind of a time capsule movie because it came out in a time where movies like that weren't really being made, and he really started to turn cinema on its ear at that point. So, But I agree with you. It's not one of my favorites of his films by a long shot. So it is his first film, and it did make quite an impact on the movie scene at the time because of its dialogue and its ultraviolence and all the pop culture references that he's been known to make in his movies. One thing about Reservoir Dogs that that I just kind of recently found out, because I never really studied this film too much, a good portion of the movie was ripped off from a a Hong Kong movie called City on Fire, including a lot of key plot points and scenes and characters. That's one thing about Quentin Tarantino that Chuck and I, if you listen to our Confessions of a Dangerous Mind uh, review on our last episode, we talked about how he is known to rip off a lot of directors and not give credit for it. In this one, he seemed to rip off about half the movie, so... He's a douche. (laughs) (laughs) So what else did you like about the movie? What did you like about the movie? My personal favorite part of this movie was um, Buscemi's performance. And uh, he deserved an Oscar nomination. He's very good. He's he's great in this movie. And I think he kind of carries the movie on his shoulders as one of the main performances in the movie. He's just great. I also like the most memorable scene in the movie being the cop torture scene. I think it's a scene with, like, really great dialogue and just overall excellent cinematography, which I won't talk about cinematography throughout this podcast because Tarantino is a master of cinematography, so. Um, but yeah, it's got a great song backing it, and uh, it's pretty uh, pretty violent. If you're unfamiliar with the torture scene that he's talking about, it's it's one of Tarantino's iconic scenes in his movies. He tortures a cop by cutting the cop's ear off, trying to get information out of them while stuck in the middle with you by Steeler's wheel plays on plays in the background on the radio. That's another thing we should point out too that uh, the entire soundtrack 
to this movie is all basically being played on a radio in this warehouse where they're they're torturing this cop and the DJ on the radio is played by the comedian Stephen Wright, who does the real dry one-liners. But yeah, Stuck in the Middle with You by Steeler's Wheel, which is a real fun kind of upbeat song over a torture scene at the time, and, and really still to this day is is unusual and kind of unnerving. So that, that was a really great scene. I think that might be like one of the best. I'm gonna go off on the limb and say that might be one of Tarantino's like the top, one of the top five best scenes in his entire filmography. Yeah, it's a great scene. Um, so one more thing for Reservoir Dogs here. Yeah, I thought throughout this entire movie that this was a possible prequel, or until the character of Vic Vega or Mike Madsen's character. Yeah. Um, I thought his name was Vic Vega, so I got confused with him. Because I thought this might have been, like, Vincent Vega after, like, Pulp Fiction. But in both movies, the Vega character dies. So mm. it just confused me. And Tim Roth's character, Mr. Orange? Mm -hmm. Am I right on that? I think okay. so, yeah. Um, Mr. Orange um, is played by Tim Roth, who in Pulp Fiction plays a character named Pumpkin, which confuses me because pumpkin pumpkins are orange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you're right, yeah. I don't I hadn't know. I really thought about that. Yeah. That was just confusing to me. Like, did he take his character and kind of play off of it and make it into a different character entirely? I don't know. It's kind of weird. Well, I think they're totally different characters. I think the orange and the pumpkin might be either ironic or coincidental or something. I don't know. But it, it possibly both of those yeah. things. Yeah. I don't know. It's just kind of interesting to me. <laughs> Our next movie is Pulp Fiction, my favorite of all of the Tarantino movies, and I'm, I'm giving that away early, but that's okay because I love this movie and I always have. The cast of Pulp Fiction includes Samuel L. Jackson, John Travolta, Uma Thurman, Bing Rames, Harvey Keitel, Bruce Willis, Eric Stoltz, Rosanna Arquette, Amanda Plummer, Frank Whaley, Christopher Walken, Maria De Medeiros, and Quentin Tarantino. My favorite movie of Tarantino is one of my favorite movies of all time. It's in my top five for sure. I saw this movie ten times in the movie theater. Um, and then after it came out on video, I bought the VHS cassette of it and proceeded to watch it 50 to 100 times afterward. I just, I love this movie. At the time, there was nothing like it. He took his uh, first film, Reservoir Dogs, and amped it up by about 100. And Pulp Fiction was like nothing else at the time. And it, it, it completely opened up, kind of broadened my horizons, I guess is the best way to put it as far as movies are concerned and made me want to explore cinema a little deeper. I don't like Quentin Tarantino as a person, but I got I have him at least partly to thank for broadening my horizons as far as movies are concerned. And later on in life, he went on to buy the DVD edition to that movie, a <laughs> Blu-ray edition, and then a different Blu-ray version, which we now own on our humongous shelf. That's right, and uh, the digital copy, too. So. And the digital copy. <laughs> you can tell he loves this movie. <laughs> I love this movie. I do. One great thing about this movie, very quotable lines, um, still being quoted to this day in, in a lot of pop culture. My wife and I often quote the line, I don't think Buddy Holly's much of a waiter if we ever go out to a restaurant and have bad service. What's one of your favorite lines in the movie, do you recall? I just love the whole um, monologue of Ezekiel 2517, oh, yeah. but at the same time, I quote this almost all the time whenever at restaurants, that is a tasty burger. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is a tasty burger. <laughs> yeah, I, I quote that, like, I quote that so much it's unbelievable. And that line was uttered by Jules Winfield, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who in my opinion is not only maybe the greatest of all, greatest all-time character in a Tarantino movie, but maybe one of the greatest characters ever. Jules Winfield is the shit. He's so awesome. He's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal in this movie. Samuel L. Jackson, I mean. But um on the other on the other side of that duo is um 
It's it's John Travolta. Okay, okay, okay. So I know you hate John Travolta. I despise John Travolta. I know you do, and I don't like him much either. But this is his best work, in my opinion, is Vincent Vega. He's hilarious in this. Yes. He's hilarious in this, and if he has had any major shining moment in his career, in my opinion, it's this. So, And Saturday Night Fever is a good movie, too. In my notes, it says, talk about how John Travolta is possibly the worst part of this movie. (laughs) Is that just my notes? (laughs) It's just your notes, (laughs) because he's not the worst part of this movie. Uh, if you don't understand that reference, go back to the Carrie episode. <laughs> <laughs> In my opinion, the worst part of this movie is the troublesome use of the N-word. So, yeah, this is yeah. this is a regular theme in Quentin Tarantino's movies, the fact that he somehow has a license to just throw out the N-word anytime he feels like it. And somehow the there are still a, a long line of black actors that are willing to work with him, and I just don't get it. I truly don't. Even... When we get to the two Civil War era movies that he put out, Django Unchained and Hateful Eight, the use of the N-word in those movies you would come to expect for that time period. However, I just feel like he uses it for comedic effect and uses it irresponsibly. And I just, I don't get it. I don't, I just don't understand how he gets by with it and doesn't get called on it. It's, he's he's irresponsible with it. I, and, and yeah. And a lot of people might say, well, he's writing for those characters. He's writing, you know, for black characters. He's writing for racist characters. Yeah, I get that. But if you're using it as a, as a punchline, then it's going to get repeated and it's going to be, it's going to normalize the word and you don't want to do that. So I just don't agree with it, but that's Tarantino and somehow he continues to get by with it like he does a lot of things. You can just tell that this guy is a terrible person. I've seen an interview with him in like a, um, like for... Maybe we'll talk about later, but um, a reporter just asked like about Margot Robbie in a role or something like that, and he just treated the reporter like a jerk. <laughs> he doesn't like to be called out on his chauvinism, which he has in spades in a lot of cases. Um, sometimes he writes really powerful female characters, and other times he writes female characters as being second rate, and that's kind of what he did with Margot Robbie in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. She is one of the best actresses in Hollywood, and he gave her six lines. Yeah, in that about movie that. And yeah. showcased her dirty feet. So hey, uh, that's Tarantino. He 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 is a big fan of feet. <laughs> so I think I'm going to wrap up Pulp Fiction by saying that it's it's a perfect piece of cinema, and I love it. It's great. I love it too, and I also love the soundtrack. Let's not let's not forget to talk about the soundtrack. Yeah, Tarantino can put together a soundtrack. He curates all of his soundtracks, puts them all together, and he's got a very keen ear for really great music. Um, soundtrack to this one is pre- it's pretty much iconic as far as I'm concerned. It's Really Gonna Be a Woman Soon by Urge Overkill, If Love Is a Red Dress by Maria McKee. Those were both originals for the for the movie, even though uh, Urge Overkill is a cover. Rumble by Link Ray, and Let's Stay Together by Al Green. Just a great, eclectic soundtrack. So that, my friends, is Pulp Fiction. It's on to Jackie Brown, Tarantino's third film. The cast includes Pam Greer, Samuel Jackson, Robert Forster, Bridget Fonda, Robert De Niro, Michael Keaton, Chris Tucker, Tiny Lister, and Sid Haig. And Tarantino has uh, a vocal cameo as an answering machine voice. So <laughs> he always finds a way to work himself in. Always. Somehow. Another eclectic cast put together for Jackie Brown. He really has a way of showcasing talents of actors that have been mostly known for B-movies and, and niche movies. Greer and Forrester are perfect examples. Pam Greer, she is pretty much the, the queen of black exploitation movies with Foxy Brown and Coffee and some of those movies from the 70s. Sid Haig, a classic horror movie actor. He's got a, 
a role as a judge in this movie, which is off, off character for him. Hmm. You know, Chris Tucker, primarily known for comedies, has a somewhat dramatic role in this one. Michael Keaton is, well, he's Michael Keaton as a cop. Uh, so, you know, he's he's really got a really eclectic cast here. Does a great job with them. Gives them great roles. Uh, Samuel Jackson's character is just chilling. So, really great stuff. I feel like this is one that gets a bit too much hate. Like, it gets undeserved hate. Yeah. And I went on TikTok, like, several times before this. I looked up Tarantino rankings. And this, for most people, is either last place, second last, or third. And... That that's not okay. This movie doesn't get this does this doesn't deserve that hate. Like, like maybe people enjoy it. Maybe they do enjoy it, and it's just not their favorite, and it's just their least favorite of his. Or maybe they just do hate it. Well, I think you you pointed out after we watched it not too long ago that, that out of all the Tarantino movies, this one seems to be his most mature film. Yeah, and I agree with that a hundred percent. This one really focuses on you know, older actors and the things that are going on in their life at this point, transitioning in life, you know, going into retirement, that sort of thing. Robert Forster's character is wanting to get out of, get out of the bail bonds business. And it's just, it's, it's definitely a, it's definitely a a more mature, older geared film than what you have with Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs and pretty much the rest of his, of his oeuvre as it would be. (laughs) So, but, uh, and I think that's why a lot of people, Maybe not necessarily hate it, but they but they don't like get it necessarily. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't skew to a younger audience really. So I didn't like Michael Keaton in this movie. No, I don't know. I don't know how to describe what I didn't like about it. It's just I just didn't like him in this movie. It just I did. I thought he was funny, and it's hard for me not to like Michael Keaton because I just think he's great and everything. Yeah, but I can see what you're saying because his his character is very cocky and arrogant, but most of his characters are so. <laughs> it's like it, it's like he's maybe playing a fictionalized version of Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> My God! No, let's not make Tarantino that cool. No, um, he's just arrogant and cocky. Another thing that's different about this movie is that it's not an original script from Tarantino. It's actually based on a novel by Elmore Leonard called Rum Punch. Um, Elmore Leonard, most mainstream audiences know him for um, Out of Sight, the George Clooney movie. He he wrote the book based on that. Get Shorty, he wrote that. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe he wrote the story of Raylan Givens, which turned out to be the Justified series. Great writer, great noir writer. But uh, yeah, first script he that he cranked out, maybe the only script that he's cranked out so far that's based on someone else's work because he loves his own voice. So, about this movie. It's great. It really is. But it is so long. <laughs> like, it, it's only 154 minutes. So, a solid 2 hours and 34 minutes. But it feels so much longer. Well, he doesn't make a short movie. Yeah. No, except for Reservoir Dogs. He, that was only an hour and 30. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. But I mean, this... for the most part, his movies are generally over 2 hours on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But this one just felt extraordinarily long compared to what else he's written. Like, Pulp Fiction flies, and mm-hmm. Django also, in some sort of way, it flies too, even though there's several long scenes of dialogue in that movie. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, It just feels so much longer than the rest of his movies, besides The Hateful Eight, which we'll get to later. <laughs> I think the pacing of this one's a little slower, but again, it's the, the maturity of this film. It, it's It's... Kind of a slow burn, and it's got a really great payoff, though. So yeah, so it does the the speed of this film or the pacing doesn't really bother me because it's an interesting story, and to me, that's all that really matters. So yeah, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. It's not my favorite of his movies, but I definitely enjoyed it. And I had only seen it. I saw it once in the theater when it came out, and I hadn't seen it again until we watched it last week, and uh, I was pleasantly surprised by it. I didn't. I didn't really. And again, at the time, I was really young when it came out, but I didn't really get it necessarily compared to the rest of his films. But now as I'm a little older, it, it definitely resonates a little bit more. So, so yeah, and I'm glad you liked it, though. It It's good. Yeah? It's good. Good movie.
All right, since we have to, it's time to discuss Kill Bill. Okay, mm-hmm. let's just get out of the way and call it our both of our least favorite Tarantino movies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hate it. Not a fan, not a fan. No. But let's talk about it anyway. So the cast includes Uma Thurman, David Carradine, Lucy Liu, Vivica A. Fox, Daryl Hannah, Michael Madsen, Michael Parks, the great Michael Parks, Sonny Chiba, Samuel Jackson, Sid Haig, and also we had Zoe Bell, who would later show up in a couple of Tarantino movies as an actor, uh, doing the stunts for Uma Thurman. And she is a renowned stunt person, one of the best in the business, and she does all the stunts for Uma Thurman in this movie and did for a couple of other Tarantino movies as well. So, um, And, of course, Tarantino has a voiceover in the movie as well. At some point, he's a, a director. I don't know. I don't I don't remember that, but very, well, very fun. We'll, yeah. take, we'll take their word well, for it. Yeah, he's yeah. in everything, so... Well, let's talk about the pros and cons of this movie. So for some pros, for me, for sure, is the fight sequences. The fight sequences are amazing. Zoe Bell is amazing. Just a, an incredible stunt person, an incredible action star. You know, this I, I would have been completely fine if she was the star of this movie, really, because she's just wonderful. The fight sequences with her and Vivica A. Fox... Uh, with Daryl Hannah, and then the scene in the uh, the disco with the crazy 88s. Those are all pretty fantastic fight sequences. Yeah. The one with Daryl Hannah where they completely destroy a trailer is just a blast to watch. Yeah. Uh, with one really nasty scene of gore in it. Yeah. Um, and then the crazy 88s fight sequence, that is just any, everything you want from a kung fu movie. So, just um, great, great, great stuff. So... I'll say this. Volume 1 is an entertaining blood fest. It's great. And I I like it. I like it. I like it. I'm going to say that I do that. Hmm. For Volume 2, though, it's genuinely horrendous. Nothing exciting about it other than the trailer fight. So Hmm. my thought on this, my my cons specifically, number one, it's his worst script. It's just awful. It's not good. He was starting to get he, he was starting to get cocky with the script. Um, and starting to get cocky with his his monologues and his his pop culture references and all this. And I mean, there's a scene where just made my eyes roll practically out of my head when he's when when poor Uma Thurman had to utter the line. But as the scene is dissolving from one to another, she has to say, "Silly rabbit, tricks are for kids." Yes. And I was just like, "Oh my god, who thought that was a good idea?" Well, Tarantino did, I guess. What an um, idiot. It's, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Silly rabbit. Tricks are for kids. Shut up! Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the two movies, they they have these great fight sequences, and they're, you know, they're going to lead up to a fight with a big bad ultimately at the end. The first movie, The Big Bad, is played by Lucy Liu, and that scene ends up being just like a disappointing letdown. Yes. It's a very toothless fight, and it ends before it begins practically. And then spoilers when she finally gets to when she finally gets to Bill in the second one, what is there she... isn't even a fight. It it's she does the little five finger heart punch or whatever it is, and that kills him. that kills Bill. It's like it all led up to a heart punch. That's it. You're gonna tell us that I watched this for four hours and I was expecting a really fun fight. We get there and she punches him in the heart. Really? That I, mean, I didn't expect David Carradine to throw down like a really you know, vicious fight sequence, but his stunt person could. And I, you know, I was really expecting the showdown and it was nothing. Speaking of David Carradine, I hate him. (laughs) I hate him in this movie. I just, I hate him so much. I hated his performance almost as much as I hate the movie, The Graduate. That's, (laughs) that's saying something because I hate The Graduate. This is where you polarize the audience there, buddy. Yeah, (laughs) I know. Because The Graduate's a classic and yeah, but. I hate The Graduate. He hates The Graduate. Well, he, he can't stand The Graduate. I can't stand The Graduate. (laughs) So, I mean, that's Kill Bill. Yeah, that's Kill Bill. If you've got four hours of your life that you want to throw away, (sighs) have at it. Go nuts. Oh, one more thing about Kill Bill. Sure. The animated sequence in the first one's not bad. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. it's cool. I like it. Yeah. It's... Even though it's even though it's anime, and I I another one that may polarize the audience. I don't like anime. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was this was nice. I didn't mind this. Yeah, I mean it's a great multimedia presentation for yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kill, yeah. Kill Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Close my name and both types, sing and shout, that's 
wrap around the belt and hold tight, shut your eyes, girl, you set me up for Zion. And now we discuss Death Proof. Yeah. And we both are excited about this because yes. I know you and I both love Death Proof. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. You I love it so much that it's your favorite. Should I bury the lead? It's your favorite Tarantino it's movie. It's my favorite Tarantino movie. I. It. It's a strong number two for me. It's so, <laughs> so great. You gotta man. love it. Man. <sighs> Death Proof is probably the most overlooked of the Tarantino movies because it was part of the Grindhouse double feature, which sadly flopped in the movie theaters. But in my opinion, one of Tarantino's strongest works. Just an just an incredible car movie um, and revenge movie. Yes. Oh, man. So great. Let's talk about the cast. The great, the powerful, the one and only Kurt Russell. Uh, Zoe Bell has her first acting gig in this one, and she's fantastic. Rosario Dawson, Vanessa Ferlito, Sidney Tamia Poitier, Tracy Toms, Rose McGowan, Jordan Ladd, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Eli Roth, Omar Doom, Michael Parks, Marley Shelton, and Quentin Tarantino as a bartender. He, <laughs> he's tolerable in this one. He, he, he does have my favorite line in the whole movie, too. Uh, <laughs> who is Who is Stuntman Mike? He's a stuntman. <laughs> What's his name? Stuntman Mike. What's he do? He's a stuntman. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So let's talk about it. By far, in my opinion, one of the greatest car chases of all time. Yeah. In the second half of the movie. Yes. That would be when Tracy Toms, Zoe Bell, Rosario Dawson, uh, they're all chasing him around the countryside in, the, in their cars. And he's got the upper hand at first. And then when they get the upper hand, you see... How much of a coward he truly is. And it's hysterically funny. (laughs) Hysterically funny. (laughs) (laughs) He's screaming like a lady. He's he's pouring alcohol in his wounds and just (laughs) screaming. So to set it up, he's a a Hollywood stuntman who is actually moonlights as a killer. And it's almost like a sexual thing for him. He stalks young women and then ultimately runs them down with his car. And that Sometimes, leads to some great gore. Oh, incredible gore, yeah. Yes. The movie is split in half, basically. There's two different two different storylines that are both somewhat similar but have different outcomes. The first one is a, a, a set of four friends, one of them being a, a, a popular Austin DJ played by Sidney Poitier, uh, his daughter, not the real Sidney. He's dead. Also, uh, Vanessa Ferlito and Jordan Ladd, they're all part of that group. He basically stalks them at a bar, uh, but he is so charming and, and, and fun-loving and everything that they sort of have a rapport with him. And then ultimately, he runs them down and kills them in very gruesome fashion with his with his car, which is a stunt car. Uh, it's built like a tank, basically, and he just mows over them. So. And the car is death-proof. The car is death-proof. It's amazing. And it proves to be right because... Yeah. In one scene, he goes flying over a car, bl- obliterating the women's faces with his tires, which is awesome uh, yeah. to watch. Yeah. I mean, good God, it's so poor, cool. Poor Sidney Poitier loses a leg. and Yeah. And, and uh, the car's death-proof for Kurt Russell, but not for poor Rose McGowan. <laughs> yeah. Her poor head he, bouncing around the cage inside there. Yeah. yeah. She keeps getting her head slammed against a... Uh, just keeps getting her head slammed against the dashboard, and it's... <laughs> Let's not spoil too much. Let's go ahead and... Yeah. This is one movie that, that Tarantino wrote some great roles for women in. Um, yeah. The second half of the movie, that's when we have uh, Tracy Toms, Rosario Dawson, and Zoe Bell. All three characters are in the movie business, and they are in town for a movie shoot. And they end up going to check on a car that somebody's trying to sell, and then the poor guy's car just ends up getting destroyed. <laughs> because they're chasing Kurt Russell over the countryside and ramming the car right and left and jumping it and just busting the shit out of it. Yeah. But those characters are all three just fantastic. Yeah. Oh, man. As You said that you don't like the first half as much as the second half. I gotta say, I think I like the first half better. Do you really? Yeah. The second one has an amazing, phenomenal, climactic ending to it. But yes. I feel like I just love the, um, the first half more because of, like, how much... Like kind of character development they use in the first half for mm-hmm. the characters, and you don't want them to die. No, and they end up dying, and it's <laughs> it's upsetting. It's not nice. Yeah, 
they're all great characters. The, the first half of the movie, those characters I don't love as much as the second half. I just think the second half, those characters are just fascinating and they're hilarious. And you can tell that they spent enough time around each other that they all became really good friends that played out on screen big time. I mean, they, they all had such great chemistry with each other. Man, this one this one rivals Pulp Fiction for me. I mean, it's close. It's close. I love this movie so much. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's it's very close. One of his best scripts, too. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of long dialogue scenes in it, but the cool thing about it is a lot of them are all in one shot, too. There's a diner sequence, mm-hmm. which I believe holds a mm-hmm. five-minute or longer one take. Yeah, it's probably closer to ten minutes, and oh. they're all just sitting around the table talking about talking about people that they work with and just all kinds of different things put together. And it's one long one shot and the, the camera's just panning around the table to listen to all of them talking and telling this, their stories and, and their banter. And Kurt Russell's in the background looming at the bar, listening in on their conversation. And you can, you have to look for him, but he's there. It's great. Which is really great. Yeah. Now I have like two more things I would like to talk about. Three more, three more things. This movie has possibly his best soundtrack ever and it shows great music just left and right it's it's great yeah and i love it yes the next thing is the intentionally bad editing which is absolutely hysterical to watch because it's definitely just edited like a grindhouse movie and it's great right and then the last thing is the possibly one of the greatest funniest endings of all time (laughs) yes (laughs) We won't spoil the ending because it deserves to be seen, but it is hilarious. And it's it's the best possible ending for this movie. It's just, it was wonderful. And it takes place after a very frightening car chase. Yeah. Which is something that needs to be seen as well. Because yeah. we're not describing it to you what it is. <laughs> no. I have only one complaint about this movie, and one only. And it's it's very petty, but it's just me as a music and a movie fan. Mm-hmm. I feel like it has one of the stupidest lines in his movies, too. Not as bad as the Tricks are for Kids line, but... Okay. They're talking about the song Hold Tight by Dave D. Dozy, Beaky, Mitch, Mick, and Titch. And the character played by Sidney Poitier, she's the, the famous DJ. And she's highly opinionated about music, like most DJs are. And she says that Pete Townsend was almost in that band, but he ended up joining the Who instead. And in her opinion, he probably shouldn't have joined the Who. and He should have joined that that group. I'm like, yeah, because the Who was such a failure. <laughs> <laughs> They've only written yeah. something that just yeah. gets played over and over yeah. nowadays. They had such a terrible career, the Who. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just not, not selling out stadiums at all, no. Yeah, what a bad yeah. career move that no. was, joining the Who. Yeah. yeah, but I feel like that kind of... I, I don't that's, know. That's one of those lines where, look how cool I am. You know, look yeah. how cool I am. I don't think Pete Townsend should have been the Who. He should have been in this group that had one song yeah. on this soundtrack. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a stupid line. I'm yeah, sorry. I get, yeah, I get that. <laughs> that aside, spectacular movie. Unbelievable. It's so underrated. Yeah. If, if you haven't seen Death Proof, you watch Death Proof. Yes. And you enjoy it. Watch Death Proof. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't just watch Death Proof. You love Death Proof. That's right. You, you have you have no choice but to love Death Proof. You you think it's perfect. You <laughs> you cannot not think it's perfect. He's, it is Death Proof. <laughs> he is he's putting this these thoughts into your head and you're gonna <laughs> like it. It's Death Proof. <laughs> the, the movie is Death Proof. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's Death Proof. And now another great Tarantino movie, The Inglorious Bastards. The Inglorious Bastards stars Brad Pitt in a fantastic role. Melanie Laurent, Christoph Waltz, Eli Roth, Michael Fassbender, Diane Kruger, Daniel Bruhl, B.J. Novak, Omar Doom, Mike Myers, Sam Levine, Paul Rust, and Samuel L. Jackson as the narrator. Tarantino is in this movie twice. Uh, He plays a scalped Nazi. And he's also an American soldier in the Pride of the Nation propaganda film. So, yay. Two roles. And he'll have two roles in another film coming up, too. Yay. God, what a great movie. Yeah. Man. 
this is another very long movie. This is almost three hours long. Oh, yeah. But well worth it. I mean, it's it's a hell of a ride. Oh, yeah. I, I think the strongest part of this movie, aside from the cinematography, which is absolutely stunning, are the characters. Brad Pitt is Aldo Rain. Hysterically <laughs> funny. Uh, just just a, 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 an amazing character. Melanie Loren is Shoshana. She's, she's wonderful in this movie, too. But I think we all agree that the, the, the movie is stolen by Christoph Waltz. Oh, my as, God. As Hans Landa. Yes. Whew. Man. He's, he's frightening. He's a force of nature in this movie. He's, he's just amazing. I feel like he's got the best dialogue in all of Tarantino's movies. It's definitely He's definitely one of those people that Tarantino, I won't say discover, because Christoph Waltz had a, has had a big career in Europe. But he's definitely a guy that Tarantino was like, oh, I'm going to write for this guy and show the world how great he is. And, you know, he did it. He, because Waltz ended up winning an Oscar for this movie, and he deserved it. He did He's just a real bastard. <laughs> uh, he's just a terrible, terrible human being, oh and my God. and just but funny and and just smart. Car- oh, incredibly smart. Yeah, he's incredibly did you, smart. Did you guys know that he's the only one in that in the entire movie that actually speaks four languages? Yeah, that's amazing. It is amazing. And another thing, did you know that this movie took over a decade for Tarantino to write? I didn't know that. Yeah, it took over a decade. That's great. It And it turned out like this? Wow, look at Cyberpunk. That took seven years, and look what that's like. <laughs> this took a decade, and it turned out amazing. You're you're relating uh, Inglorious Bastards to Cyberpunk, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't play it. <laughs> but I've seen so many terrible things about that game. Yeah. Well, this, there's definitely, this movie is definitely not terrible. It's a it's excellent movie. unbelievably good. So this movie included eight total Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, Christoph Waltz won Best Supporting Actor, and truly deserved it, yeah. along with several others. Yes. Now, the biggest problem I have for this movie is its pricey Blu-ray prices. <laughs> the, the cheapest you can find this is $25 on Amazon, or you can buy a used one, which we want original copies, so... Right. Which I looked and tried to find a steelbook for this movie because I'm a I'm a guy that likes steelbooks because of how they feel and how they look. He he, he enjoys a steelbook. I do, mm-hmm. and that I looked on Amazon for that fifty dollars. Yeah. Which if it's that pricey, I'm gonna just buy the Blu-ray because at least that's cheap in some sort of way, but it's expensive for a Blu-ray. Yeah. You're a young man without a job. You can't afford to pay 50 bucks for Blu-ray. No, I can't. No, no you can't. So you gotta, No, I can't. No. This is also Tarantino's first shot at rewriting history, which he does later on in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as well. And by rewriting history, I mean literally rewriting history. So spoiler alert for this movie if you haven't seen it, but he gets to kill Hitler in this movie. Good. As well as Hitler's top brass, like Joseph Goebbels and... Yeah, he he gets to kill them in gruesome fashion, and hey, you know. Look, he did something good. <laughs> Bully for him, but, you know, it's still rewriting history, so. But hey, that's it's, it's, it's his right as a as a filmmaker, and. I love the gore that they used for Hitler. <laughs> yeah. They destroyed that man. Yeah, he, he took a. He took a face full of machine gun, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And but. so did, like, 300, 400 other Nazis. They exploded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was very gratifying. And Glorious Bastard is definitely one of his best, I think. Yeah. Yeah, by far. Like the pine trees lining the winding road I've got a name I've got a name Like the singing bird in the crook and toad I've got a name. I've got a name. And now it's on to a movie that I struggle with. I, I I enjoyed it the second time around, I guess, a little more than the first time around. But I still have some hang-ups with it. But uh, Django Unchained is our next film. The cast of the movie includes Jamie Foxx, Christoph Waltz again, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kerry Washington, Samuel L. Jackson, Walton Goggins, Dennis Christopher, James Remar, 
Don Johnson, Amber Tamblin, Bruce Dern, MC Ganey, Jonah Hill, Zoe Bill, Robert Carradine, Tom Savini, Michael Parks, and Quentin Tarantino again in two roles. <laughs> yeah, one of them is a variation of a clan member, and then the other what was the other one? The other one was a um a uh, mover, a mover. That's right, he was uh, yeah. the Australian guy. The Australian guy. Right. And our, I'm surprised he didn't say it. He didn't say the N word. He didn't. No. It was it was good. He, he, he did, didn't say it. He did say blacks, but uh. he didn't say the N word. But um, but he did get to explode in the movie, and that was fun to see. That <laughs> was beautiful yeah. to watch. Yeah, he got blown up. It was awesome. Yes. My but... my biggest peeves with this movie: number one, his complete irresponsible overuse of the N word. Now this is one of this is the first of the two Civil War era movies, and this movie's about slavery, so you're going to hear that word. It's unavoidable. But just the way he uses it throughout the movie is it it, it begs people to requote it, and that's what makes that movie that's what makes that word normalized. And and you can't do that. And he's just irresponsible with the word and I don't understand how he continues to get by with it. And I've already said that so I'm not gonna beat that into the ground. Yeah, that's <clears throat> Possibly the only thing I can really complain about in this movie yeah. that he used it so much, way too much. Poor Walton Goggins, man, <laughs> he just gets it all in both of these movies. Walton Goggins is a Southern man, and because he's a natural-born Southern man and he has a great way of delivering lines, he seems to get a lot of the great racist lines in the movie. Not yeah. great, but I mean substantial racist the di- lines. The dialogue. In this yes. Movie. Yes. And uh, he also gets a lot of that in uh, Hateful Eight, too, so, where he plays a very known racist in that movie. Poor guy. My other problem with this movie is the amount of showing off that Tarantino seems to be doing in the script with his long, overlong monologues, especially when DiCaprio shows up. Good Lord. <sighs> Just long, overwritten monologues and... It's like, look what I can do. Look what I can do. I can write long monologues in a script. And yeah, okay, yeah, you sure do. And overabundance of them. It becomes monotonous, in my opinion. The movie probably could have been cut down by about a half hour if he would just shorten the monologues. I could possibly fight you on that one. Go for it. I love the dinner scene. That whole sequence right there is... That's an is, intense scene. It's such an amazing sequence. And it's on a pretty interesting topic on what they're doing, but it's... It's great, but I agree with you on that. It, I mean, it's just what he's mostly known for is his, is his screenwriting, you know, his dialogue, his, and that's great. Uh, but you can still write a really great, intriguing movie without having long, silly monologues. And he really went to town with the monologues in this one. I mean, a really great example of how he didn't use overlong monologues and he had a really great script is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Yeah. You know, that that is probably his most subdued movie as far as dialogue is concerned compared to everything else that he's done. That movie is more visual than, like... It's a beautiful movie. It is. It's yeah. possibly his most well-shot movie. Fantastic gore in this movie. Oh, my God. It's, Just it's blood great. fountains. It's <laughs> gross. <laughs> Somebody gets shot, and there is a rocket of blood straight up into the air, and it is thick as molasses. It's just some fantastic blood showers and oh man lovely. <laughs> I feel like there's one thing that I think all men can say that they are bothered by this movie with hmm. all the shots to the wang. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of lots of gunshots to the to the groinal area. And yeah. a near um near snipping of the nuts. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that scene was not nice that, to that watch was unfor- as a um as a male human being. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't happen. Luckily it didn't happen. Yeah. It it was it was almost there. <laughs> Poor Jamie Foxx almost became a eunuch. <laughs> great acting, though. Jamie Foxx is great in this one. Christoph Waltz, again, has another killer role in this one. And DiCaprio steals the show, like always. Yeah, I thought Christoph Waltz stole it personally, but DiCaprio's great. <laughs> DiCaprio's great. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, hysterically funny in this one, even though his character is very troublesome, but super funny. I hate his character oh, it's, so much. Oh, he's a despisable character, but he's so funny. He is. <laughs> so funny. So, yeah. Django, definitely low on my list, but... It's I, high on mine. High on yours, it I know. Is. I know, I, but... I love the movie, just, even though it has its flaws. I, I still love it. It's mean. It's not a nice movie. It's, 
it's got well, I mean, several flaws, but you can't really you can't really make a happy slavery movie. No, so no, you can't. No, but anyway, Django Unchained. Eh. Yeah. Eh, eh, eh. Yeah. <laughs> What seems to be the problem All the ones you tell your troubles to They don't really care for you Come and tell me what you're thinking Cause just when the boat is sinking A little light is blinking And I will come and rescue you now it's on to The Hateful Eight, another underrated Tarantino classic, in my opinion. Cast includes Samuel L. Jackson once again, the great Kurt Russell once again, Jennifer Jason Lee, again with Walton Goggins, Damian Bashir, Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, Bruce Dern, James Parks, Zoe Bell, Channing Tatum, and narration by Quentin Tarantino. Hmm. I'm not going to get in, go on to the N-word rant again on this one. Uh, more of that bullshit. But this movie is one of his better storytelling efforts, I think. Uh, the story on this one is superb. Really yes. great story. So for this one, I never did watch the original cut. I was planning on doing it, and I never did. But we watched the extended version, which is three and a half hours. And I can say that it was a good three hours spent. I think so, too, yeah. Netflix uh, put out the director's cut of the movie, and it's, like you said, three and a half hours long, almost four. It's split up into four episodes, which was a really great idea. So it's almost like a mini series. If you have Netflix, it's worth checking out. So this one's highly underrated. This is another one where I can, on TikTok, it was not showing up very highly ranked among his best movies. Like I was saying, it may be ranked last, next to last with Jackie Brown, which, it, you know what? Screw them. Screw them. <laughs> the best possible approach on this is not to trust TikTok for your movie needs, but Don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's giving me recommendations, so that's nice. That's nice. Don't let TikTok form your opinion. That's what I'm saying. That's not what I was doing at all. Yeah. <laughs> this, this movie is great. <laughs> I, I like it a lot, yeah, at least. Absolutely. Like, So for TikTok, it's like, it gives me good recommendations for, like, movies I've never even heard of. Like, a movie called Come See, which I'm planning on watching with Dad soon. And maybe if it's not too, too rough to cover, we might do it? Maybe? I don't know. Like, another one is called Lahane or Hate in Spanish. Yeah, we might cover that at some point if it's not too rough to cover. Um... Yeah, well, that's TikTok. That's the rest of the TikTok discussion for this. So, thank you, TikTok. Thank you, TikTok. This was, we're not asking for anything. But if you want to sponsor us, we're open to that. Go nuts and sponsor us if you want. This is. But you can sponsor us. We, we, uh, we like cash. cash. Yes, that would be nice. Yeah. <laughs> I love Kurt Russell's performance in this movie because Kurt, it's Kurt Russell. He is the actor. He's one of the greats. He, he's one of the greats. He, he's he possibly. He can. And he should have been casting Carrie over Travolta. <laughs> I agree with Chuck. But, um, yeah. Excellent performances from Russell, Jackson, Walton Goggins, and Jennifer Jason Lee. Yes. Lee got an Oscar nomination for this movie. I'm pretty sure she didn't win. She um, didn't win, no, but she she's, she's very, very good. She's funny in it, too. Yeah. There's one thing I don't like about the movie. I'll, I'll tell you about it. Um, I don't like... What Samuel L. Jackson did, the, the guy who he walked through the snow. Oh, no, 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 no. I I hate that, dude. Well, none of these characters are really good guys. Let's put it that way. Samuel L. Jackson's the closest to being a good guy in the movie, but he's not a good person either. <laughs> mm. uh, there really are no heroes in this story. Kurt Russell's character is just a total bastard. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's old knight. He's awful. He's a, yeah, just a overbearing awful human being i was hoping maybe mm. joe gage did something good and no he didn't do no. something good he was part of a part of a gang yeah yeah and even the narrator's not good because that's tarantino i think our only real good guy in the movie is uh the guy driving the wagon what's his name ob yes ob, OB seemed like a good guy he met an ugly demise, but he seemed like a good guy. Yeah, he, he the only thing that i can possibly say that he did bad was drive them <laughs> Well, he got hired to do so. so he did, you know, so. He could have been hauling Mother Teresa. It wouldn't have mattered. He, he'd get paid to, to drive somebody. Yeah. He would. Right. Fantastic dialogue in this movie. Yeah. It has a very clever story. Mm -hmm. 
And once you hit like the two hour and 30 minute mark of the director's cut, it blows your mind. <laughs> your mind explodes. That's a funny thing to say. Once you hit the two and a half hour mark, that's when it really kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's just that that part right there just blew my mind. Yeah. Like with Tatum's character coming into play. Yeah. But you don't know that it's coming or how it's happening. So you don't. So. That's when he starts to tell the story behind the story that Tatum shows up. So The moment I got confused in the film is whenever they shot Jackson's nuts off. Because, like, <laughs> like, I was very confused because there was someone under the floorboards in a basement. When was the basement ever even set? Why wasn't the cord there? Why was there nothing there that even sh- closely resembled a basement? He just got his nuts shot off, and it just confused me. Like, but then they tell the story, and it all what? makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. I I love it. H.J. Boss Hitbox. Now for all of jitterbugs from Pico Rivera, baby, I'm gonna cut one loose for him. Hey, heck, doll, your mama looking for you. And finally, the last film and Tarantino's credits so far. I mean, he he's talking retirement, and I, I couldn't care less either way. I mean, he makes great movies, but if he retired now, he'd be going out on top, in my opinion. But Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is, is, is the final entry in our Tarantino film series here. So I thought he was writing another film. He, the, he said that there was one coming out. And he's been talking retirement for years, and he just never falls through that suddenly he has another picture up his sleeve that he wants to put out. So he's, you take it with a grain of salt. Honestly, I've just got a great feeling he's not going to stop until he wins Best Picture. Well, I mean, he may never get that. He may, yeah. He may never get there. He he got as close as he could with uh, Inglorious Bastards, I think, and maybe Pulp Fiction. But I mean, Pulp Fiction was going up against some unbelievably intense contenders that was, that was a rough year <laughs> that was whenever he was going up against the Shawshank Redemption and uh the non-deserving winner for Scump mm. it didn't deserve let's not, it let's not talk about that it no we don't I'm not gonna talk about for Scump because because your mother's listening yes <laughs> yeah because because my mom's listening <laughs> So the cast includes Leonardo DiCaprio Brad Pitt Margot Robbie Emile Hirsch Margaret Qualley Timothy Oliphant, Dakota Fanning, Bruce Dern, Damian Lewis, Luke Perry, Al Pacino, Kurt Russell, Zoe Bell, Michael Madsen, Tim Roth, and Quentin Tarantino, who does a voiceover in this one as a director on a commercial shoot. First of all, let's start off by pointing out Brad Pitt. His character Cliff Booth is probably my second favorite character in the Tarantino universe behind Jules Winfield. Yes. Oh, man, Cliff Booth is fantastic. Yeah. What a character. (laughs) He's both funny, charming, and just great. I'm glad he won an Oscar for it because he's... He deserved an Oscar long before it, but uh, it's nice to see him get one for such a great, great role as this one. Yes. Yeah. So the movie is centered around Leonardo DiCaprio, who is an actor who is struggling to stay relevant as the times are changing. And he is mostly known for TV work and some movie work where he's in, he's in a lot of westerns. And they're shooting a show in within the movie called Bounty Law, and I would watch that show. Yeah. <laughs> that was cool, man. They're a pretty long segment of them shooting this episode of Bounty Law, and it's DiCaprio trying to stay relevant, trying to keep his name out there, and trying to do really good work to stay noticed. This show, Bounty Law, is like, it's like an old Western show like Gunsmoke. That was really, really good stuff that they did. Yeah. Put together. This has an amazing soundtrack. One of the best ever, in my opinion. If you listen to this, it sounds like um you're listening to a radio station. It's so cool. That the entire thing is played out like as you're listening to a radio station during a, an afternoon in Los Angeles in the 60s. It's brilliant. It's just awesome. They use actual commercials and some made-up commercials, some real commercials. There's a DJ leading into the different tracks and so forth. It's just, man, it's perfect. Nine o'clock in the City of Angels. <laughs> That leads into my favorite song in the soundtrack, Hush by Deep Purple. Yeah. That song is fun. It's a classic. Yeah. It rocks. It does rock. (laughs) Yes. It absolutely rocks. 
So, like I said earlier in the show, it is incredibly shot. Possibly Tarantino's best cinematography. It's the second film with Tarantino changing history with the killing of the Manson family members before they could kill Sharon Tate. Mm -hmm. Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio fight off the Manson family. The moment where it becomes super Tarantino. Yeah. We should say up up to this point, this is not really this is not not a, not very Tarantino ish. Like it's a, it's another pretty mature film, and when it gets to the last twenty minutes of the movie, that's <laughs> when it turns into a Tarantino movie for sure. Yeah, <laughs> Brad Pitt summons a dog to attack one of them. He full on fist fights another, and Leonardo sets one on fire in a pool. <laughs> 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 with a flamethrower that he got from a movie where he was fighting Nazis. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, joy. Oh, that final 20 minutes is just fun. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this movie. High on the list for me. Speaking of lists, let's go ahead and get to it, buddy. You want to? I know you like to rank movies, so we're going to rank our Tarantino movies. Let's go from uh, worst to best. All right. Yeah. Go ahead, man. My least favorite Tarantino movie, which we said earlier, is Kill Bill. Mm -hmm. My second least favorite is Reservoir Dogs. Though it's a good movie, I don't think it's his best or his worst. So my seventh favorite Tarantino movie is Jackie Brown. The rest of these, aside from number one, could all change at different moments depending on how I'm feeling. Number six is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Number five is Django Unchained. Number four is Pulp Fiction. Number three is The Hateful Eight. Number two is Inglorious Bastards. And number one is Death Proof. So my number nine would be Kill Bill. It's a terrible movie. Number eight, Reservoir Dogs. Number seven, Django Unchained. Uh, number six, Jackie Brown. Number five, Inglorious Bastards. Number four, Hateful Eight. Number three, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Number two, Death Proof. And number one, Pulp Fiction. Very nice. I think both of our lists are pretty solid. Pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. Pretty solid. Yeah. Although I know you aren't going to like um, how the Hateful Eight and Inglorious Bastards both beat out Pulp Fiction. I know you're probably not going to enjoy that. But... Well, it's better than Kill Bill beating out Pulp Fiction. Or... Oh, ho. Or uh, Django beating out Pulp Fiction. So. Yeah, that would never happen. No. No, that wouldn't happen. Well, that was our first episode of Dylan's First Run Features. Are you happy with it? I am. You think it went well? I think it did. All everything, right. it just seemed like everything was happening that could possibly stop us from recording this episode. And <laughs> glad, luckily, it didn't end up thundering as much as we were yeah, expecting. We have, a, we have a thunderstorm brewing, and uh, we were uh, just thinking, well... If there's a lot of thunder, just create ambience with this, but, uh, yeah. It maybe thundered once or twice, which may you might not even be able to hear, because we're in a pretty solid room here. We have <laughs> my room, which has our movie shelf. Yes. Like, my favorite poster for The Shining. Um, a Poltergeist poster, and just movies everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Dylan's room is... I hate to use this expression because it sucks, but Dylan's room is as close as thing to, uh... A man cave that we have in this house. So. <laughs> oh, you don't use that saying. I know, it's terrible, but... No. I know, it's terrible, but I'm just saying, you know, it, it's it's a, it's a good room. Good, it solid is. room. So. We ha I'm just... I have a bed that faces a TV, and that, that helps, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I watched some of these. So, yeah, some of these. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, until next episode, this has been Dylan's First Run Features. Thank you, everybody, and good night. Dylan's First Run Features is presented by the All Night Drive-In Picture Show. It is produced and edited by Markham Harvey. Our music is by Dylan Mason. I'm your announcer, Dylan's mother. This has been a Clown Business Coalition production. Good night, everyone. This is Lane Hewitt speaking.